Hi. Uh, yeah, sorry, there were some technical issues. Uh, but I think we're all good to go. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, today, I would like to talk to you about the procedural encounter system in Horizon Forbidden West. Um, but first of, all, you, first of all, you all might be wondering, who is this guy and why is he talking to you? Uh, my name is Leszek Szczepański. Hi. Uh, and I've been making games for almost 15 years now, which is terrifying to admit because it really feels like I'm just starting out. And over this time, I worked on over 30 mobile titles and three AAA games. Uh, most importantly, Kills on Shadowfall, Horizon Zero Dawn, and Horizon Forbidden West. Also, I've been extremely interested in procedural content generation for video games. And that passion has seeped into my work, into the systems that I built for both Horizon games. Today, I'm here to discuss the procedural encounter system, a system that is responsible for presenting the player with opponents while exploring the open world of Horizon Forbidden West. But uh, before, you dive, before we dive in, for those who might not be familiar, Horizon Forbidden West is an open-world action role-playing game published by Sony Interactive Entertainment uh, for PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5 earlier this year. It's a sequel to the, to the 2017 Horizon Zero Dawn. The game is set in a post-post-apocalyptic world where gigantic machines have taken over and humanity is no longer the dominant species. In this talk, I'll be discussing the process that went into uh, the developing of a procedural encounter system, uh, as well as how it works. However, to put all of this into context, um, I will start by discussing, discussing the procedural content generation systems in general, and follow that up by mentioning some of such systems that are featured in Horizon Forbidden West. First, let's briefly discuss the concept of procedural content generation systems in general. So what actually is procedural content generation? The most common definition is algorithmical creation of game content with limited or indirect user input. But to elaborate on this, it means methods of creation of game content, either offline during game development or at runtime during gameplay, that is performed by an algorithm that is only configured by a developer rather than being performed directly by them. Although the first type of procedural content generation um, that comes to mind, or in Google results for that matter, um, is generation of terrain, biomes, or dungeons, there is much more to it. To make it slightly easier to discuss, let's divide these kind of systems into three categories. But please keep in mind that these categ this categorization is hardly scientific and made only for the purpose of this talk. Let's start with the most obvious type, infinite gameplay generators. These would be systems where generate content that the player is directly interacting with, things like dungeons, opponents, quests, or loot. These are meant to generate complex content that normally would be created by designers directly, and that is to be replayed over and over. Most notable examples would be the procedurally generated dungeons in NetHack, or the procedurally generated narrative in Sunless Seas or Sunless Skies, or the randomized weapons featured on, in Borderlands, and many, many more. These usually feature in games that are to be played over and over, for at least for a very long time. The goal is to create a system with an extremely large probability space with as little manual labor as possible. Second category, workflow enhancers, are for generating content which precise uh, details are not really relevant, often used for organic or natural elements like trees or rocks. It doesn't matter where every single leaf of glass, grass or pebble are located, as long as they adhere to certain rules like type, area, and density. This kind of procedural generation is used mostly on the tool side, offline. However, in some particularly large games, these systems are used as a form of compression. You can generate methods, uh, meshes, or other forms of data and simply put them inside your game assets. However, storing a set of rules and having the game engine do the heavy lifting can save a significant amount of space. A good example would be 
the generation of trees and vegetation in the speed tree middleware. Pr uh, placing of grass and foliage that is available in most 3D engines nowadays. Or in general, pretty much everything you can do in Houdini. These serve two purposes. One, to decrease the amount of, labor, amount of manual labor required, and secondly, for decreasing the amount of game data that needs to be shipped with the game. And finally, simulations. A simulation is an imitative representation of a functioning of a real-world process, behavior, or system over time by means of a function of another one, which is an absurd mouthful, but in much simpler terms. It's one process imitating behavior of another one. A lot of game systems can be put this in, in this category, as all modern games have a certain amount of simulation in them. But in the context of procedural content generation, however, simulations are used in the place of manual scripting or direct placing of gameplay elements. The examples most relevant to us would be <laughs> uh, in Crusader Kings, Wars and conflicts are not predetermined by the designers, but the political simulation of the world ultimately decides about war and peace. In Shadow of Mortar, fights with enemy lieutenants are not designed directly, but emerge through the interaction between the player and the nemesis system. In Saints Row and similar games, cars and pedestrians are not manually placed, but are spawned based on the rules to make the city feel more natural and dynamic. As before, one of the reasons to use these kind of systems is to have a machine take over some, if not most, of the mundane manual work. But more importantly, these kind of systems can give, a game, can give the game a more natural and dynamic feel, and in many cases, facilitate emergent gameplay. Now, Let's discuss some of the procedural content generation systems that are featured in Horizon Forbidden West, as well as some of the proposals that ultimately got scrapped or rescoped. This is not an exhaustive list, but these examples are the most relevant to our discussion. Horizon Forbidden West, as well as Horizon Zero Dawn before it, use a system for procedural placement of vegetation, pickups, various effects, as well as small wildlife. This system uses a number of 2D maps created by the designers, which are later processed in-game at runtime. These 2D maps represent where and how various objects can be placed in the world. The system then dynamically spawns these objects in-game using the GPU. If you'd like to know more about this, check out the GDC talk by my colleague, Jaap van Mauden, GPU-based runtime procedural placement in Horizon Zero Dawn. It is not uncommon for open-world RPGs to, some sort of, to have some sort of a procedural quest system. A good example would be the Radiant system in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. During the development of Horizon Zero Dawn, a system like that, codenamed Hydra, was proposed as well. Given that the base quest system that we already had was made of clearly defined blocks, it wouldn't be an overwhelming task to add a procedurally generative layer to it. However, given the fully authored nature of Horizon's world and narrative, it wouldn't, provide any, it wouldn't really provide any benefits that would tie with the rest of the game's design. Horizon at some point ends. There is a level cap. Therefore, adding a system that would infinitely keep the player in the game, although extremely cool, wouldn't provide any many benefits to the game at large. A simplified, over, a simplified version of it did end up in both games, though. The player is able to gem generate simple fetch quests for themselves. They don't prov provide any rewards or XP, uh, but rather are used to help to keep track of items that are to be gathered for crafting or for trade. If you'd like to learn more about this, uh, check out my GDC talk from a couple years ago, Building Nonlinear Narratives in Horizon Zero Dawn. During the pre-production of Horizon Forbidden West, we created multiple prototypes of procedurally generated dungeons. We tested multiple designs and multiple implementations. However, ultimately, everything was scrapped for very similar reasons that we already scrapped procedur procedurally generated quests. 
there just wasn't a good enough reason to keep the player in the game world uh, indefinitely. As mentioned before, Horizon is a game that ultimately ends. On top of that, we would need to create a whole new and a rather complex system in order to make this feature work. And to be frank, we already had enough things to do. From the very start, we wanted the world of Horizon feel, feel real and dynamic. Among many things that we did to achieve that, we made sure that the enemies that spawn, spawn for the player to fight would change over time and react to various game events. In Horizon Zero Dawn, we had a system which would fit that purpose, but end up needing uh, too much manual labor while not giving us as much variation and reactivity as we wanted. For Horizon Forbidden West, we designed and built a completely new system that was to serve that purpose. That system went through many changes, adjustments, and iterations. Let's discuss that system in greater detail now. As mentioned before, we needed some sort of a dynamic, reactive system for spawning opponents from the very beginning. The system we had in Horizon Zero Dawn worked as follows. A designer would prepare a different combination of machines that would spawn. That means which ones and with what numbers. Scenes would be manually placed in the world which would choose to spawn one of those combinations. At runtime, when the player would enter the range of the scene, it would choose one of those combinations at random and spawn the machines. Simple, and although it did the job, there were issues. First of all, the system required a lot of manual labor to set up. All of the machine combinations had to be manually prepared and assigned to appropriate scenes. Any control was done through scripting, and those scripts also had to be manually written and maintained. All scene prototypes need to be manually prepared and maintained as well. Secondly, it wasn't an easy system to tweak. Although design could choose to reinforce certain patterns, there weren't any, really sp any specific parameters that we could adjust that would directly impact what gets spawned and how. That was not only a problem when balancing the game, but it was extremely cumbersome to optimize. Thirdly, having this uh, collection of scripts, machines, scene prototypes, meant that there was a lot of very different game data that had to be maintained. A lot of that could live in different parts of our game content structure, requiring a lot of discipline from the designers not to lose track of all of it. Which leads to the final point. There wasn't really any centralized managing system that would allow to have a quick overview of how it all is set up. We decided we needed to fundamentally change uh, the workflow and our way of thinking. Instead of looking at individual encounters, we decided to think about machines inhabiting certain areas of the world. These areas, which we called habitats, would be painted on the world map. An encounter would check which machine habitat it overlaps and spawn only those who are available in that area. We wanted for habitats to evolve over time, reacting to the day-night cycle, story progression, and other aspects of the game, going so far to considering adding migration patterns based on players' actions in certain areas. We wanted not only to spawn machines, but in fact generate whole encounter spaces. Opponents would spawn based on the encounter location of the world, but also the surrounding geometry. Some aspects of the area would be modified for the encounter as well, adding stealth options or takedown possibilities. We wanted a high degree of automation. We wanted to address the amount of manual editing of everything we needed to do so far. The system would analyze the player, the world, the story, and pick the right encounter. Designers wouldn't need to tweak individual encounters, but only the system as a whole. It all sounds Beautiful, doesn't it? As you can imagine, reality quickly kicked in and the ideals needed to be revised. First of all, we decided to focus solely on spawning of machines and other opponents using the system. As in reality, this was the only part that needed improving. While having the rest would be nice, we already had good solutions for procedural spawning of geometry and other elements. Therefore, creating a replacement for these additional systems was deemed too expensive and too involved for way too little benefit. Secondly, 
it was decided to give designers more control over what and how is being spawned. From an engineering perspective, it would have been fascinating to push the automated nature of the system as far as possible. But ultimately, that did not fit our development philosophy of creating this carefully crafted world. Going so far as making certain special encounters fully handcrafted. Finally, although we aimed to have everything integrated into our game editor, actually using an external graphics application for drawing of the habitats as images and then, then only importing them into our editor was deemed a good balance between the time needed to implement the system and how much it would decrease our iteration rate. So let's take a quick look, or longer look, I suppose. Let's take a look at what the system looked at its first fully functional iteration. First of all, all the relevant elements of a system. The habitat. The habitat. <laughs> uh, the, it's, it's this 2D map that would be painted in the world. A group would define a machine type with conditions for it to spawn. A category uh, would define uh, what is to be spawned. So the designer wouldn't really uh, specify uh, machines directly, but specify that they want heavy machines or scavenging machines. An encounter is what is placed in the game world and what actually do, does the spawning. And in order to make things easier, encounters would uh, share settings. And these encounter settings specify what the configuration of a specific set of encounters. And finally, we had the system, which was this central manager uh, of a whole setup and it would contain certain global parameters that we could tweak. The procedure followed by the system would be as follows. First, the player enters the range of the encounter. Then, the encounter checks what habitat it's in uh, while checking if they are enabled based on the attached condition. This provides the encounter with a list of available machines uh, machine groups that at that specific location. All groups are filtered by the allowed categories for that encounter. The, this creates the initial list of all possible machines to spawn. Then that list is filtered by the, all the conditions attached to the groups. That filtered list is assigned weights based on the variety parameter of a given encounter, the uniqueness parameter of a system, and what resources the player needs that the machines might provide. The variety parameter in the encounter settings determines how the likelihood of a given group being chosen decreases with every time it already has been chosen for that particular encounter. The uniqueness parameter in the system works in the same way, but is global for the whole game. Then, a group is being chosen from that list according to the weights at random, as many times as the settings specify. With every choice, the, weight, uh, the weights of the list will be adjusted. Finally, from every group, a randomized amount of machines is spawned. And this worked pretty well, sort of. It definitely served its basic purpose. We did have a randomized encounter, uh, we did have randomized encounters with regional variability. The problem was that the results were very unpredictable. Many different combinations of machines could be spawned, often not making much sense from a gameplay perspective, with no real way to narrow them down. A very wide range of amounts of machines could also be spawned. We could have everything between two or 20, depending on many, many factors, also without any reasonable way to control it. Another problem was that large amount of virtually identical habitats that needed to be maintained because each habitat data structure um, contained only one machine type, there were a lot of maps, often exactly identical. And importantly, it heavily suffered from the, one of the most common issues feature, uh, with one of the most common issues that is featured in most systems that uh, are randomly generated. Things, although different, were not distinct enough. Each subsequent encounter was different, but it didn't feel different. The system definitely had potential, but needed numerous iterations, which we did go through. I won't bother you with every change and every adjustment, but ultimately, we came up with this. <laughs> 
As you can see, some modifications were made, but the system hasn't changed fundamentally. The most relevant changes were moving a lot of conditional properties from the group, gr from the group to the habitat. Having habitats be able to reference multiple groups while the groups be able to reference multiple types of machines. Impact of what kind of resources the machines provide on what spawns was totally scrapped. And most importantly, adding of a relation data structure, th which defines which two groups of machines are allowed to spawn together and how, essentially forming this two-dimensional relation table. The new procedure is as follows. The player enters the range of the encounter. The encounter checks what habitats it is in and creates a list. Then that list is filtered by all conditions attached to the habitats. That provides it with a list of available machine groups at that location. All groups are, fil are filtered by the allowed categories for that encounter. Then the filtered groups are looked up in the relation table. From that, all possible pair combinations are created. Each pair combination is assigned a probability weight. That probability is modified by the system uniqueness setting to make sure there isn't too much repetition. After that, a pair combination is chosen at random based on the assigned weights. And finally, from every group, a randomized amount of machines is spawned. Although the modifications were not major, the improvements were quite significant. The biggest impact had the introduction of a relation table. First of all, it gave uh, the designers more direct control over what could spawn. Only two machine types could, spawn, uh, could appear in a single encounter. This also made the whole system more distinct. No more did different encounters have only minor differences between them. And finally, by limiting the possible combinations of machines, uh, as well as moving the spawn amounts to a single place, it made it much easier to predict how the system would behave after tweaking. We were pretty happy with this solution. The system met our goals, however, it still wasn't perfect. Even with these modifications, there was a lot of data to process. But to address this, we introduced some debug tools. The first one, the Habitat Viewer, is uh, fairly simple and allowed us to visualize individual habitats in the world, uh, as well as the current state of all the conditions attached to those habitats. And in this screenshot here, you can see these purple boxes. And these purple boxes are essentially a projection of a 2D map on the 3D world representing the area of a habitat. In the window here, you essentially see a list of all the habitats that we have with a list of all conditions or, and, their, and their states. So for example, whether the difficulty setting for a game is met for the habitat or whether the time of the day is, is good for the given habitat. And also we had a small log which would uh, log all the events related to the habitat system so we could track what is happening and in what order. It was mostly used early in development and to make sure all encounters are where they should be and the painted maps translate to the world as we expect them. The second tool, the encounter viewer, allowed us to test and monitor all encounters individually. This one, was, uh, this one was used extensively by both the designers and QA. Most importantly, it showed all the relevant data. It showed all the, it showed all the encounters in the game in, in sort of a tree view. Uh, for each encounter, it would show a list of valid relation table entries here. It would also visualize the selected encounter area in the world, which is something you can see here in the background. Uh, and for every relation table entry, as well as associated groups, it would, have, uh, it would show the probabilities, including all the current modifiers, which is something you can see here. Later, we also added features requested by the QA, which allowed for quick and extensive testing of the system. Features like teleporting to a selected encounter, resetting of the currently running encounter, and disabling certain entries from the relation table uh, for a given encounter. These enabled us to test and improve the encounters really quickly without the need to go back to the editor or even to reload the game. It's also worth mentioning that the relation table got fairly big by the end. 
However, because all of this data existed in a single location, and because we created pretty robust visualization tools, its size was manageable. Ultimately, the system worked pretty well. It was definitely an improvement over our old setup. It proved so useful that we extended it, uh, we extended it with a feature that allowed for robots or machines to call in uh, reinforcements. However, not all is perfect. It turned out that while the system is a great fit for big open spaces, it doesn't perform as well in small, densely packed ones. In those, we need to add more fully manually crafted encounters. Although at the moment we are fairly satisfied with how the system works, there are some improvements that we are already thinking about. First of all, we'd like to drop the external graphics application step and fully integrate the process into our toolset. Secondly, we'd like to revise which properties used for filtering habitats are not used and remove them and add ones that might be more useful in the future. Also, it turned out that the system was still a little bit too difficult to predict uh, when it comes to tweaking uh, probabilities. probabilities. So we are looking into streamlining probability assignment. And finally, because some encounters need to be individually tweaked, something that wasn't really possible in the system, we are looking into ways some encounters can be modified directly beyond what the system allows. So what did we learn from all of this? First of all, as games are getting bigger and more complex, and that includes everything between single developer hobby projects to gigantic blockbusters, all benefit from some kind of procedurally generated content. Both Horizon Zero Dawn and Horizon Forb Forbidden West benefited tremendously from utilizing such systems. There is a plethora of options and methods, and it's good to look into them early into game development. Just, uh, just make sure uh, that you choose the right system for the right kind of game. You don't want a very organic, autonomous simulation in a highly authored game. And inversely, you don't want to try to create emergent gameplay through laborious scripting. Secondly, probability and randomness are tricky. Human brains are really bad at dealing with it. And we know that very well when it comes to looking at player behavior. But this is just as important when looking at developers. In all systems that feature some sort of randomized result, we need to work hard to make it clear as possible what changes might bear what results, either through simplifying our algorithms and data structures or better vis visualization tools. And finally, working with procedural content generation in both Horizon Zero Dawn and Horizon Forbidden West reminded us about one of the hardest to swallow pills in game development. Every system is only as good as well it serves the design of the game. To create the best product possible, you can't be afraid to change your assumptions, go back to the drawing board, or even scrap already created systems entirely. Thank you for listening. Hey, hello. Uh, thank you for your talk. Thank you. Uh, and I have a question. Why did you scrap the, the resource impact uh, from, from, from the system? Um, two reasons, to be honest. Uh, so the question is, why did we sc scrap um, impact of resources on uh, what spawns? And there were two reasons. One was that it was another moving part in the system, which made the whole thing more complicated. And the second, actually more important, was that uh, it would allow the player to manipulate drop rates. Uh, so it's not a multiplayer game, so that's not that big of a deal. But ultimately, we didn't want the player to be able to manipulate uh, what they currently need uh, to have different machines spawn in, in the world. So ultimately, these two things. OK, thank you. <laughs>
do I understand it correctly that the encounters change every time the player comes there again? Uh, did you make some kind of saving system so if the player doesn't kill the machines, they stay the same? Uh, so if I understand correctly, you're asking if we some save in some uh, some way the state of the encounter so that the, there is not too much repetition. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so uh, first of all, the system is randomized. So regardless of whether we saved or not, uh, it would be different each time the player arrived there. Um, we didn't... We didn't really save anything from a randomized encounter. Essentially, each time you arrived, it would uh, it would uh, roll the dice from the start. The only thing we did save was uh, information on how many times a given uh, group was used, because if you've seen before, we had a system which would essentially uh, make sure that the given group is not used again and again and again. So its probability would drop all the time, uh, over time, depending on a certain parameter we could uh, tweak. So the amount of times that group was chosen, that was saved, and that's it. See, so player could avoid some groups, and yeah. then they will they will never see them again because he saw them like ten times and never fought them, and the system will make them disappear. Well, it it wouldn't really make them disappear because uh, you know all of these. Uh, these changes are balanced, right? So the thing is that you have group A, you have them three times, then there is a lower probability, then you spawn group B, and then their probability drops, and at some point levels out, right? Yeah, I see, yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> Thanks. Hello. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I would have Thank a you. couple of questions regarding the design, but I will limit to d this one. Uh, in particular, uh, do you have an idea how many uh, machines or how many encounters the player would have to win to actually be able to upgrade all the stuff in the game, in the Forbidden West? Uh, oh, wow. Uh, I mean, upgrading of items in, in the game it involves many things, so it's not only encounters, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, compared to uh, Zero Dawn, the amount of armors and weapons increased considerably, and you can upgrade them in like several levels. So I think if you have actually calculated the number, how many machines you would need to kill to be able to do it all. So, so I have a very disappointing answer for you, because I'm sure we did, but I have no idea. <laughs> OK, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. With uh, regard to iteration speed, uh, did you immediately prototype this within the game engine, or did you do some like bench testing in spreadsheets? At which point do you hand it back and forth? Uh, so actually, we put it in the engine fairly quickly. Uh, one of the designers came up with uh, the general idea. I sat up, sat, sat down with him, and we discussed what we need. And pretty much after that, we started uh, to have a first prototype of that. So uh, I don't think there was any at least long process of having it in a spreadsheet. It was fairly quickly in game. Uh, to be honest, I don't think there would be much benefit on, uh, on prototyping it outside the game, given that we kn knew we needed something, and this seems like a good direction, although we, we need some iteration. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for a very interesting lecture. Thank and you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, the quantity and quality of enemies in these encounters, it was uh, calculated by the algorithm or by game designer. Like the um, hard one encounter, it's like the too big mechanoid or the uh, much easier, it's uh, free little mechanoid. It's uh, make like a game designer or like the algorithm thinks like, hmm, here maybe they like 15% uh, of possibility that it would be the uh, free little monsters or the 30% of possibility that it would be five. So if I understand correctly, uh, the question is whether uh, the balancing of a difficulty of a system was done 
by the design or was it done by the system algor algorithmically? Yeah. Uh, so, yes. <laughs> um, in, in general, uh, the, the way it worked is that um, the designer could specify uh, with certain probability how encounters would go. So, of course, they wanted to have certain areas which would be more difficult, but they also m could make it uh, more varied that every now and then a less difficult encounter would uh, show, uh, show there. So uh, the designer would have most control, but because the system was based on probability, uh, the system had also some decision to make, although it didn't really care uh, much about whether to make it difficult for the player or not. It cared more about, okay, we're spawning, uh, we have a 50% chance of spawning big machines or a 50% of uh, spawning small machines and just roll the dice. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Your you. system um, looks very new and uh, fresh. So could you uh, tell a little bit more about uh, testing process? So which approach did you use? Black box, white box, gray box? How closely did you work with uh, programmer? Did you have some performance issue and optimization issue? And uh, uh, I don't know more about QA process because it seems like very, very interesting to test and very hard to understand how it could be done. Thank you. Uh, so uh, when it comes to testing process, I, I'm, I'm unable to go really deeply into that because I wasn't directly involved. I, the thing which I did the most was uh, give tools to the QA to be able to, to, to test, uh, test the system. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, we, uh, we modified our debug tools to be able to actually mo not only give information but also modify the state of the game so that they could, with the press of a button, reset the encounter and check different combinations of robots, pretend that the player did something else uh, uh, other than they did so they could uh, test the edges of the system. Uh, so uh, to, to kind of not directly answer your question, uh, we focused mostly, uh, we knew that the system would be complicated and it would break easily, so we did all we could so that the QA, while replaying each encounter, could uh, test different combinations of the encounter as quickly as possible. And uh, when it comes to optimization, uh, later, th indeed, there was a problem, uh, because with a game like this, with you know, these kind of complicated game assets, uh, at some point you just run out of budget for memory and uh, processing. So essentially we would go from region to region to, to region and create sort of a heat map uh, saying which regions go, uh, in which regions we have really low frame rate, go into these regions and modify the encounters because sometimes we would have encounters which would be really cool but because they spawn so many robots the, 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 uh, uh, the frame rate would just tank. So we would have to modify in certain areas the encounters to be simpler, smaller, or less frequent. And uh, did uh, your testers uh, know the code and use auto tests, or just only like a manual tester without uh, code knowledge? So for this particular feature, we d uh, we mo for the vast majority, we use manual testing. So there were, there were testers, one or two, who essentially played through this over and over. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. I would like to ask uh, what uh, were the tools uh, that you created that actually made it uh, from, let's say, randomized, uh, randomized encounters to, like, meaning, uh, to, to allow you to make meaningfully different gameplay and uh, I, I know that you, you, you were talking about those pairings of uh, two creatures, two machines. Can you, can you elaborate on that? Um, to be fair, I don't fully understand the question. Basically, um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to ask uh, what was the difference between just randomized encounter uh, as, as a first step uh, to, to allow you uh, to get to a meaningfully different gameplay. So it's not just randomi randomized uh, machines, mm -hmm. but actually you are playing something really different, so there is different meaning in that. Um, so 
uh, the, the, the process uh, was not actually that elaborate. We had the first iteration of the system, and we realized that indeed we have randomized encounters. They adhere to the rules we set up, but they are just you know too all over the place. Uh, and uh, the designer responsible for this uh, feature sat down and figured, look, there is too much variety. We have um, we have like five types of robots spawning at once, which adhere to no rules at all. Why don't we just make pairs? And that was like the initial idea, and that's where we kind of built up. The other changes that we made were kind of uh, iterative. We realized that this uh, parameter is not used, or this parameter doesn't give us m many benefits, or maybe we want to try different ones. So these were these changes were very iterative, adding and removing control parameters. Uh, but when it comes to this one moment when we sat down, we really need to rethink our base was that relation, ta relation table. And that was when the designer sat down, look, maybe we just want two robots at a time because they adhere to our sort of encounter rules and how we want to build encounter in regards to how the player will behave. And that way we have a more control over what spawns, more control over what the encounter will look like, uh, and also later on more encounter on uh, more control over our memory and uh, uh, performance budget. Thank you. Hello. Um, you say that uh, when the player enters at certain regions, uh, it will trigger the, the generation of these uh, enemies. What happens if, for example, the player fights uh, three of these four enemies, kills, and only one remains? and decides to leave the battle. When, once he comes back, it will respawn the full group again, or that will be still the same enemy waiting for you? Uh, so it mostly depends on the distance. distance. Uh, yeah, yeah, we have like a, uh, our uh, system for managing uh, space in the game is a whole different story. But uh, to long story short, um, each uh, scene, which is how we divide space, has a number of ranges. And if the player leaves one range, essentially the, the robot disappears. But when they come back, it will reappear. But if they leave further away, the whole thing is just cleared. And if they go back, then the whole thing is started from scratch. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Uh, so after you have released the game, I imagine there are so much input data. Uh, so. Uh, how much did you actually patch the data? And have you ever considered, or what are like your thoughts on having the data online? Right, cool. So you can uh, keep tweaking the things. Uh, like, what's your input on that? Uh, so to be perfectly honest, we didn't do anything, um, at least to my knowledge, we didn't do anything like live tweaking of the parameters. So most of the things we do are in patches, which need to go through TRC, so there is like a, um, delay, uh, but for this particular system, I don't think we made any gigantic changes. I think the designers might have tweaked some parameters, uh, changed some encounters, but this, in general, the system didn't, didn't need much changes after, our sh after shipping. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Thank you. Um, have you ever encountered uh, reusage of uh, procedural systems? Like uh, one system is cut from the development, and you take a part of it or the very idea of it to create another procedural system. Um, so, not really, but it's not without trying. <laughs> Uh, initially, we wanted this system to actually b be built upon our uh, procedural uh, spawning system that we use for foliage and trees and what, whatever. But after some initial tests, we realized that that thing is not fit for what we're trying to do. So, if we had system which would actually, if we had systems already which would fit the systems we were trying to build, we would totally do this. But it just happened that we needed to build th things from scratch. I think the only thing we did was just iterate and improve from Horizon Zero Dawn to Horizon Forbidden West on already existing things. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'd like to know uh, the process of uh, balancing how often 
uh, do these encounters happen? Uh, if you have some sort of system uh, for that, uh, how this stuff is calculated? Uh, so, I don't think there is any system which manages how often they happen, at least uh, often as in time-wise. They are only uh, spread out uh, area-wise. So the only way you uh, have a delay is how much time it takes to take from A to B. So that's the only way it was done. And balancing where uh, things should be, uh, unfortunately, I wasn't directly involved in, so I can't tell you much. The only thing I know is that uh, our world design put a lot of work into making sure that areas are populated in an interesting way, but also in a way that doesn't tank the frame rate. So there was a lot of work to put to it, but again, it was more area-based, location-based rather than time-based. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Hi. Um, there is something I would like to see about this system, and it is some kind of machine learning. Is there a possibility for the creatures or machines to learn from the player's you know, action? and evolve over time? So, so you know, it's one of these things that, that if you ask me, yeah, hell yeah, let's do this. It sounds great. <laughs> but uh, these, kind of, these kind of setups um, are great engineering, uh, engineering challenges, but I, uh, in systems like these, they don't get that much benefits. Uh, this is smoke and mirrors, right? So it, it pretends to be extremely smart from the perspective of a player, but it's, it's not that complicated in the end. Uh, and uh, we definitely could do some things that the players would change over time with difficulty and whatnot, but the player would probably notice like 1% of that or half a percent of that. So I'm not saying we won't do something like that in the future, but uh, given how I've seen systems so far, there isn't really a use case for this kind of uh, elaborate setup. Although me personally, I would love to do something like this. I'm disappointed a little bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah me too, to be honest. <laughs> Hi, thanks for the talk. Thank you. Um, given that this tool kind of implies the huge collaboration with the designer team, right? Uh, was there anything that was like highly requested from the designer side but didn't make to the final product? Like something that was like requested from the designer team that would help them, but they didn't really make it there? Uh, to be perfectly honest, the only thing that uh, design wanted and didn't end up in the system, which is worth talking about, is the fact that we had to use Photoshop for painting of maps instead of doing it our, in our editor. The rest, for the most part, is what they wanted. Uh, there might be some details, not exactly as we designed, but you know, as we do develop things, things change anyway. So to be honest, most of the things are in the not doing it our, in our editor is the only thing I can think of. Thank you. <laughs>